These are the mechanisms of action of hyperbaric oxygen. And if you look at these, what you'll see is it's affecting every single one of the pillars of chronic illness, and it's affecting every single one of the hallmarks of aging. So if you have this safe and effective therapy, and it's been known to help so many people with so many different conditions, why aren't more people using it? I've been doing this for 17 years, and I have 20 minutes to tell you everything I know. It's probably not gonna happen. So uh, I I'm gonna provide you with what I would consider to be you know, an introduction to a hyperbaric medicine. So you really understand what it does and how it works. Because to me, if you knew what it did and how it worked, you'd be way more inclined to pursue it if you haven't already. By the way, who has, who has done a session in a hyperbaric chamber before? Amazing, amazing. Who hasn't? Don't leave here being able to raise your hand. You have an opportunity downstairs to do sessions in a hyperbaric chamber. So make sure that you don't leave here being able to raise your hand to that question. Who's offering hyperbaric as a clinic? Awesome. Very cool. So, you know, I've had such an amazing opportunity, I suppose, having gotten into this 17 years ago and seeing enormous holes in the industry and seeing that proper education on safety, proper education and protocol has been missing. And my wife and I have spent the last handful of years, you know, putting together a lot of this information, now offering, you know, courses and certification in hyperbaric medicine, specifically, not for wound care or diabetic neuropathy, although we use it for that and it's amazing, but more for all the other 100 or 150 other, you know, off-label, so to speak, uses of hyperbaric oxygen. And so, as I said, you know, it's been growing year after year. I'd say when we first started hyperbaric, people were like, hyperbolic? What's that bariatric machine that you guys are using, you know? So now uh, people actually know what hyperbaric oxygen is for the most part. I uh, have seen chambers before, you know, and they're starting to understand the role and the importance. And I want to cover a lot more of that detail today as we go. So uh, as sa stated earlier, I'm on the board uh, and the faculty for the International Hyperbaric Association, where we hold conferences and we get to teach all kinds of information around hyperbarics. Also on the board and the faculty for the International Board of Undersea Medicine, where we uh, certify practitioners or technicians in hyperbaric oxygen. By the way, I'm from Jersey. I talk really fast. So please pay very close attention to each word that I say, all right, take notes. I am finishing a PhD at the University of Miami in molecular biology with a focus in regenerative medicine. Why? Because I have three kids that we were homeschooling. I was really bored running three companies, two clinics, and I felt like going to school full time was a good idea. And you know, really what it was, was I teach hyperbaric medicine. I get a lot of questions and people are like, is soft chamber the same as hard chambers? Low pressure, the same as high pressure. I heard uh, oxygen is dangerous. Is it, you know, what's this oxidation thing? I get a lot of questions. And there's some answers to some of those questions, but there's still a lot of research necessary in this field. And so I decided to go back because I wanted to help, if I was gonna to contribute to the education of people doing hyperbaric, I also wanted to help answer the really hard questions. And so now we've had some opportunity to do some of that research uh, of which we'll be publishing a lot of the results this fall. So I'm really excited about that. So introduction to hyperbaric medicine. What is it? How does it work? Really what you need to know is that right now you're surrounded by a pressure. It's called your atmosphere. And the pressure of your atmosphere is why, when you breathe in, you can actually pull oxygen from your environment into your circulation, okay? So the entire process of getting oxygen into your cells as we speak is really a pressure relationship. What happens in a hyperbaric chamber is we're just temporarily increasing the pressure and we're temporarily often increasing the percentage of oxygen. And as a result of increasing the pressure, we can drive more oxygen into the cells. It's literally that simple, although we'll go into some detail. What are some of the benefits? You should take a picture of that because I can't cover all of them, but what are some of the benefits of that? Well, increasing energy, uh, stimulating stem cells, increasing uh, neovascularization or, or new blood vessel growth, reducing swelling, reducing edema, killing infections, all kinds of amazing things happen from hyperbaric. But because it's so impactful, we often get a bad rap. How can one device cure so many diseases? It doesn't. In fact, hyperbaric cures nothing. You know, I'm very clear when I lecture that hyperbaric should not be used as the treatment of disease. Hyperbaric simply improves the amount of oxygen that you can carry. In fact, it improves the amount of oxygen you can carry so much so that at high pressures of oxygen, if you had no red blood cells at all, you could still live, right? So literally, it's bypassing your red blood cell carrying capacity altogether and delivering exponentially higher levels of oxygen that could ever be um, made possible uh, without uh, increased pressurized environment.
where the science is going now is what is a, what's that effect now on our epigenetics? And that's a lot of what we did in the research that I did out of my office over the last few years was what is the effect in longevity and what is the effect on our epigenome as a result of this oxygen? And the answers are honestly incredible. I just can't tell you because we haven't published it yet. <laughs> Hyperbaric is safe. Hyperbaric is effective, right? So if you have this safe and effective therapy, and it's been known to help so many people with so many different conditions, why aren't more people using it? You know, finally today, we're starting to break some ground on that, but I would still say that this is literally probably the most underutilized therapy in this entire place. There's still so many misunderstandings and myths, and it's the myths that surround hyperbaric, it's the misunderstandings around hyperbaric that lead to the underutilization. And pretty much I've dedicated my entire professional career to trying to dispel the myths, to tell all the secrets, to try to communicate what hyperbaric actually really does, because it's quite simple, honestly. And I hope that that has an impact on improving utilization. If everybody, I said it this morning, if everybody who wanted or needed hyperbaric knew that they needed it, we don't have enough chambers or clinics on planet Earth to support everybody. And so really my goal is just to help people understand this so that more people, like the people that raise their hands, who's running clinics in here, that more people run clinics, that more people put chambers in their facilities, that more people put chambers in their home, so that actually some meaningful number of the people who need it actually could have access to it. So one of the things that we should take home from this is this, you know, whether we're talking about injury like a TBI or concussion or post-surgical or, uh, you know, even the aging process is really just a, a series of, of injuries over time that accumulate over and over again cellularly. Our bodies are designed to heal and they do it all on their own, right? If you got a cut, it would stop bleeding and eventually heal, hopefully assuming that you're healthy. So anytime you have something that happened to you and there was an injury of some kind and the healing process gets stuck, it always gets stuck in the inflammatory process. These are the four stages of healing, by the way, if you're not familiar with them. And ultimately we have to get to proliferation. Proliferation is where all the growth factors are released. And so growth factors are the stimulation to continue the healing process. Again, it could be surgical healing or it could just be, it was a rough day yesterday and my cells need time to heal. Anytime they don't continue through the healing process, they get stuck in the inflammatory phase of healing. The inflammatory phase is necessary. You should not not have an inflammatory phase. You're required to have an inflammatory phase. However, you're required to transition from inflammation to proliferation. And what's necessary for that progress is oxygen. The moment oxygen is lost, if you lose the oxygen gradient, you lose the ability to transition from inflammation to growth factors, and therefore you lose the ability to actually stimulate healing and proliferation of tissue. So what does hyperbaric do and, and, and why is it so unique? And that's the key thing is it is a super unique therapy. So what is it doing? By the way, I am gonna skip slides because there's no way I can cover all these slides. So just bear with me on that. But I promise to answer every one of your questions later today downstairs. So how does oxygen get from the air you're breathing into your cells? It's all passive diffusion, all right? I said it was a pressure gradient earlier, remember? There's, a, there's an atmospheric pressure and that pressure is what drives oxygen into your cells. And so. How do we push oxygen from the atmosphere into your cells? It has to go down a concentration gradient, okay? So it, pe it follows the law of diffusion. Molecules move from high concentration to low concentration. How quickly or how powerfully they move is determined by the differential in gradient. In other words, if I had 99 units of oxygen over here and one unit over here, there's a lot of power for that diffusion to come across from, not, from the 99 to 100. If I had 51 units over here and 49 units, there's really not a lot of power of diffusion. Do you understand? What if I had 1,000 units on this side and one unit, right? There's a tremendous amount of power. And really, that's what hyperbaric is doing. Molecules will move down their concentration gradient until they reach a point of saturation or equilibrium. In your body, as it, as it uh, applies to oxygen, you will never reach equilibrium. In fact, you would actually reach oxygen toxicity far before you would ever reach a saturation point because your cells are metabolizing that oxygen as quickly as you can bring it in. So as we drive those levels up, we're metabolizing, we're giving the body the fuel that those cells need to move to heal, to regenerate, and to do whatever jobs they're supposed to be doing. We are on a mission to make sure that the people looking for this information have access to it. I know that there's a lot of content out there, and I know that it could be very confusing when people are trying to find the answers that they're looking for, and it's really important for me that those people can find these answers. So when you like it, when you subscribe, and when you share these videos, 
that helps the people looking for this content know that they're getting a trustworthy source and they're getting the information that they're trying to find. So please do that and help us help other people. I like to take people up in elevation before I take them down below sea level with a hyperbaric chamber because it helps people understand how it works. So as you go up in elevation, they've experienced the idea that as we go up in elevation, it's more difficult to breathe. People say, well, there's less oxygen at altitude than there is at sea level. Percentage wise, there's the exact same amount of oxygen. So there's 21% oxygen at sea level and there's 21% oxygen at the top of Mount Everest. The difference is there's less atmospheric pressure at the top of Mount Everest and that lack of pressure creates a lower concentration gradient, meaning there's less drive of oxygen from the atmosphere into your cells. The opposite is true as we go below sea level. So as we go below sea level, pressure increases. As pressure increases, those oxygen molecules get smushed together I'll use arbitrary numbers. If I took a breath at sea level where we are right now, I'd say I took 100 units of oxygen into my lungs at a full volume. At the top of Mount Everest, maybe I only bring in 40 units because they're more spread out. Well, as I go below sea level, I can now bring in 120 or 200 units because they're more smushed together, which means the concentration of oxygen will be greater in that same volume. You understand? If I wanted to decrease my atmospheric pressure by half from, from sea level, I'd have to go 18,000 feet above sea level in order to do that, very high. If instead of cutting it in half, I wanted to double it, I only have to go 33 feet below sea level in order to do that. I bring that to your attention just to say that it doesn't take very deep depths to create massive changes in your cellular function. We could increase oxygen drive by going only 10 feet or 15 feet or 20 feet below sea level. If you look at some of those chambers downstairs, you'll see soft chambers run at about 10 feet of sea level. It's about a 30% increase in pressure. But that 30% increase is gonna drive at least about 30% oxygen into your system. If we start to add oxygen to those percentages, we can make those numbers even higher, 300%, 400%, so incredibly high. So at sea level, there's just enough pressure to basically saturate your red blood cells 100%. If I put a pulse oximeter on your finger, you guys know what that is, right? And your heart was healthy and your lungs were healthy, we should get a good reading, like 98, 99% saturation. What does that mean? It means if I gave you 100% oxygen to breathe at the surface, you could only get about 1% or 2% more because you could never be more than 100% saturated. Does that make sense? But what I said earlier was under hyperbaric conditions, we're bypassing that system. To saturate red blood cells 100% is actually quite easy. But under normal atmospheric pressure, it's impossible to exceed it. Under hyperbaric exposure, that's exactly what it's doing. It's exceeding red blood cell capacity in the first few minutes that you're in there. And a pulse oximeter is not a tool that really is able to measure that. What I want to talk about, which I already talked about that, so there's two main laws that govern this. There's really eight, but we're only going to talk about two. The first is Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law says, as I pressurize a gas, I can make that gas take up a smaller volume, right? So in the same container, as I put pressure on that gas, the quantity of gas is the same. It just takes up less space. So in a chamber, that's what we're doing. We're pressurizing a gas. And then if we hold that gas over a liquid as we pressurize it, we can now dissolve that gas into a liquid, okay? That's Henry's Law. The easiest example is a bottle of water and a bottle of seltzer. If I pressurize the gas, in this case it was CO2, I could pressurize that gas, hold it over a liquid, and drive that gas into the liquid, and we call it seltzer, right? CO2 in water. In a hyperbaric environment, what's the difference? Well, we're pressurizing a gas, but in this case we're using oxygen instead of carbon dioxide, and we're holding it over a liquid, in which case we're using your blood primarily, except we could also fill your lymphatic fluids, we could also fill your interstitial fluids, you know, what percentage liquid are your bodies? 70, 75%, right? So you have an enormous reservoir of potential oxygen capacity as we increase the pressure of oxygen and drive that oxygen into your cells. So I want to talk about this, which is, so, you know, normally red blood cells are saturated, but there's very little oxygen free flowing in your blood. Under hyperbaric conditions, you're getting both red blood cell saturation and this increase in oxygen inside your plasma. There's three main things that that does, which we'll cover in the next few minutes. The first is that free-floating oxygen doesn't have to follow the same rules that red blood cell-bound oxygen has to follow. And so free-floating oxygen has the capacity to literally go into every little nook and cranny that it needs to go inside your body. Next is, imagine you had a blockage in a capillary or some inflammatory process that wasn't allowing red blood cells to get through. What would happen to the cells and tissues on this side? They become hypoxic and eventually necrotic and die. Right? So if red blood cells can't get through, however, oxygen dissolved in the plasma can get through, 
all of a sudden, in the short term, you could nourish the cells and tissues on this side of that inflammation, on this side of the blockage in a way that could actually save that tissue. Long term, if you kept doing that over and over again, there's a stimulus of angiogenesis, rebuilding of the new blood vessels. And so after you've saved the tissue and the cells, the new red blood or the new uh, blood vessels can now hyperoxygenate that tissue normally on its own, even without the chamber. And then the last is back to that Seltzer analogy, right? So we're driving all this oxygen into your body while you're in the chamber. But when you get out of the chamber, just like a bottle of Seltzer, when you open the top, when your body comes out of the chamber, you're now releasing all of that oxygen. And so, you know, 20 years ago when we were talking about hyperbaric, the whole thing was about how much can I drive into the person? That was the whole conversation. Higher is better, right? More pressure, better. More oxygen, better. About 10 years ago, we would have said something like, Probably half the session is the time you spend in the chamber. The other half of the session is the time you spend out of the chamber. Today, I would say that probably 90% of the benefit is getting out of the chamber. In fact, the only reason to go in the chamber is so you can get out of the chamber. In other words, you have to have a loading phase. You need to go in the chamber and load up oxygen in order to get out of the chamber and start releasing that oxygen because the amount, when that oxygen's released, it doesn't just go into the atmosphere. It tries to get out of your body, but it can't. And as it's trying to get out of your body, it's literally interacting with all of your cells and your tissues, triggering a tremendous amount of tissue healing and regeneration. In fact, when oxygen leaves a capillary, it typically could only travel about 62 microns away from the capillary to interact with a cell. But because it's under pressure now and you're getting out of that chamber and that pressure is being released, that oxygen could travel up to four times further than under normal circumstances, really being able to nourish those cells and tissues. This is interesting, but I don't have time. Sorry. Super interesting. I don't have time, but you can ask me about it later. Here's what I want to tell you. I want to tell you this, that if you looked at you know, when I, I lecture a lot about inflammation and, and just functional medicine in general, we talk about the pillars of chronic illness. We talk about the hallmarks of aging, things like loss of telomeres, loss of stem cells, increased inflammation, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. These are all terms you've probably heard before. And if you looked at the pillars of chronic illness, and if you looked at the, which is that, and if you looked at the hallmarks of aging, yeah, you could definitely take a picture of these. What you'll see is that aging and illness are virtually synonymous. In fact, if you follow any of David Sinclair's work, you know, aging is the number one risk factor for chronic illness, right? And so there's enormous amounts of overlap between those two worlds. But if you actually looked at the mechanism, you should definitely take a picture of this. These are the mechanisms of action of hyperbaric oxygen. So you don't get to choose which ones you get. If you put a human in a chamber and you do it over a series of time, every one of these things is going to happen. Okay. You don't get to choose which one. You don't get to choose which order you get them. However, they are all going to happen to everybody who goes in on a cellular level. And if you look at these, what you'll see is it's affecting every single one of the pillars of chronic illness, and it's affecting every single one of the hallmarks of aging. And so even in my office, we never use hyperbaric alone. We almost always combine it with other therapies. And, you know, we could talk endlessly about how to combine the different tools and strategies that are downstairs, and we should. But even if it was just hyperbaric alone, Hyperbaric literally will touch every single one of those. And so it becomes not a cure or a treatment for any of these issues. It becomes a foundational tool required. Oxygen is a foundational nutrient required for your cells to heal, recover, regenerate. So whether you're a chiropractor or a naturopath or an acupuncturist or a DO or even an MD, but you're looking at hyperbarics through this lens, the lens that I'm describing, which is applying hyperbarics for all these off-label conditions, this is the class that teaches that. And right now it's the only class that teaches this type of hyperbarics in this way, and that's an actual certification course. Check out hbotusa.com, and uh, right across the, the top you'll see upcoming events. You can click on that and it'll show you uh, when our next courses are gonna be.